the second section of this video has to do with an overview of the material in the study guide. Now, quite obviously, I cannot go through the whole study guide. I, I'm hoping you have already done so. Yes? Um, no. Yes? Um, okay. Um, the thing is, a lot of this only makes sense if you've been through the whole study material. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the three substantive learning units, uh, four, sorry, substantive learning units, no, it's just three, and, and go through the outline, the sort of broad category within which you need to structure your thoughts so that you know what is important and what is unimportant. And just, just by the way, two rules. Do not do constitutional law. This is not constitutional law. I don't care what the constitution says. Literally don't care. That is done in another module. Um, but once I get a, an assignment with a full page setting out various sections of the constitution, I know you've lost the plot. That's not what's important now. We not care about that. And the second rule is don't do religion. I cannot tell you how many students quoted the Bible at me regarding homosexuality. I did, really guys, really, why? Okay, so what I'm first of all going to do is just go over a broad outline of the natural law legal positivism debate. Okay, so this, you have to understand that the debate between the two are about two questions. One is what we call the ontological question and the other one the epistemological question. Now you've all studied up on what is epistemology. What is it? Three words, come on. Theory of knowledge. Okay. The ontological question mean, is the question, what is it that exists? What does the reality consist of? Um, you know, is it, is the, all of this just a dream? What is the reality? What does it consist of? Is it just what you can see or is there more? Okay, so the debate between the two groups is on both. And that's the bit you missed in the assignment because you only concentrated on one. Okay, so in natural law thinking, um, they regard reality as consisting of both things that you can see, observable, and things that you cannot see. That's not observable, right? And that means that you have a set of rules that is pre-political, that is metaphysical, and that determines the validity of the law. Have those three things in, your, in the back of your mind. So, um, pre-political means what? Yes. Yes, actually it precedes the existence of states at all. So um, before there is a government that can give you rights, these rights existed. They are metaphysical. Metaphysical means behind the physical. You can't see them. Meta is Greek for behind. And physos is Greek for physical things. And the important thing, and this is the primary difference between natural law and legal positivism, is that the pre-political rules determine the validity of the law. Okay? Um, it's, it's not just that it forms part of law. If your law is in conflict with the natural law, then your law doesn't exist. It's invalid. Okay. So that's the first part. The epistemological question is as important. And it is this part that I think a lot of students missed in the assignment. They rely on human reason to find out what is the content of the natural law. They rely on rationality, thinking things up in your head and not on observation. Because you can't see the natural law. 
Exactly, that's exactly the point. You can't see it. Now, if I was, was the one, OK, sorry. If, you, if we move on, then we can see where does this come from for the various different philosophers. For Plato, it's the ideas. For Aristotle, it's the forms. For um, Aquinas, it's the Bible or God. For um, African legal philosophy, it is the ancestors. Um, for the Islamic law, it is the Quran. Right? You, you see where we're going with this. But also then they answer the epistemological question by looking at mathematics, the Bible, or custom as sort of the way in which this becomes real. Okay. Plato specifically said mathematics can show you what natural law is. Yeah. I can talk about mathematics for a long time, but I won't. Okay. So and when you read that article of Quellane, where he fails to prove that this is a natural law approach is in the rationality of it. Because he makes a basic logical mistake. Because he jumps from gay, gay rights to bestiality. It is a logical mistake to have a slippery slope argument. To say, oh, if we allow gays to get married, next thing you know, you'll marry a goat. That's not rationality. That's not reasonable to think that. So um, that's what I miss in that article. And I can't really blame him. I mean, he's a journalist. He's not a lawyer. But still, um, that is what you need to look for when you judge whether something is natural law. It's not just whether it's metaphysics. It's whether it determines the validity of the law and whether it's rational. Does that make sense? OK, more sense, at least. OK. <laughs> Then um, legal positivism obviously is the opposite. Legal positivism only focuses on that which we can see and observe and count and measure. Um, and it's created by humans, right? That's the social thesis. Human beings create laws. They don't fall from the sky. And it can be the basis for law. Do you hear the difference? It doesn't determine the validity of the law, but it is the basis of law, sometimes. That's why you so often have moral rules and legal rules that are the same. There's a moral rule you shouldn't lie. And there's a legal rule, don't commit fraud. It's the same rule. The one is the basis of the other. But it doesn't determine the validity of the law. OK, for example, in some cultures, it is OK to lie in certain circumstances. Specifically, for example, to lie to people who are not part of your group. Um, and there's a Terry Pratchett book about that as well, but uh, never mind. OK, so the fact that there's a, a moral rule not to lie doesn't mean that it determines the validity of the legal rule. The two things are separate, and that's what we call the Everyone together? One, two, three. Epistemological thesis. No? No singing? OK. Uh, OK, so um, the epistemological question is answered by human reason and observation. And that's the difference. For the legal positivists, there is the idea that you can use observation, like case law. Case law becomes your laboratory, if you want. The library is the laboratory in which you find evidence for your viewpoint. OK? And then, um, of course, the very important epistemological theory of the separation of law and morality, which all of you got. You, you did get that bit right. What's the secret? It's like love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage. You can't have one without the other. You have to have three theses before you can say it's legal positivism. That's why Quelani's I do not know how to pronounce his surname, I'm guessing. Why his statement cannot be regarded as legal positivism, because you need all three of them. Epistemological, social, and command thesis. You need both, all three of them. Otherwise, it's just authoritarianism. OK. OK, so um, then with legal positivism, the best person to use as an example is Hart, H.L.I. Hart. Uh, we refer to him constantly throughout the study guide. And then, 
So I'm sorry, there are no more chairs. Sit on the floor if you want. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and you also have to refer to both the African debate and the South African debate. They are both important. You have to look at them both. Okay. Great. Um, let's move on then to how judges decide cases, that, which is the second one of the persistent debates in legal philosophy. And you will, you will see why you cannot leave out certain things and hope to understand the rest of it. It forms a whole. We constantly refer back and forth between the various philosophies. Now, this should be familiar to you if you've done interpretation of statutes. Is it? Okay, so I can go through it fairly quickly. You have natural law theories, which will mean what? Reference to natural law. You will have objectivist theories. In other words, the idea that um, meaning is something objectively out there that you can find. And postmodern theories, which we will get to later. So of the natural law theories, we look at Islamic theories, um, which is a combination of Aristotle and Islam. Um, so it has a link towards Aristotelian natural law and also the African theories, which concentrate on um, communitarianism and uh, reconciliation. Um, and the difficult question with that is if it focuses on questions of reconciliation, what does that say about the legal procedures and processes in South Africa? What does it say about courts? and the traditional adversarial system. We'll get to that in a minute. Then there are the objectivist theories which you should know, having done inter interpretation of statutes. Um, the textualist one, which my question is, is it always positivist? Um, because obviously the text doesn't give you the answer, you still have to interpret it. And then there are intentionalist theories, um, and my question always with intentionalism is someone still decides what the legislature intended. And can that be used to frustrate the goals of democracy? And then the communitarian theories, um, the theories of heart, which says um, you always interpret in terms of the tradition. Dworkin, who has this idea about you, the precedents. Um, guys, you don't have to write this down. I will post it on my UNISA. Okay. <laughs> I see her writing furiously. Um, and then, of course, the African theories are also communitarian in that the rules and the interpretation comes from the community. Then the last one is the postmodern theories, critical theories, which is specifically um, CLS. And we will look at CLS a, a little bit later on. And then the idea of law as a language game. In other words, um, law is more like cricket, if you want to, or like soccer. There are rules, but you can always play with the rules. I've, um, there's a wonderful book um, called, um, by Alan Hutchinson called Playing by the Rules. And he uses soccer as an example of how the rules are changeable within a game and what the ref will allow and will not allow. And if you saw the recent cricket series between South Africa and Australia, and you see how there's clear evidence there's been ball tampering and the ref does nothing. So yeah, that kind of thing is what's language games. We don't really talk about this too much. If you are really interested, let me know and I will send you the article I wrote about it. How's that for self-promotion? <laughs> okay. The third set of theorists, that, uh, philosophies that we talk about is African legal philosophy. Um, and African legal philosophy is incredibly important and in much more difficult than one might think because there's very little written on it. And I assume that when you started looking for sources for the second assignment, you found this out. Yes? Yes, the difficulty is the thing. <laughs> um, 
Um, but yeah, that is why this is important. If we are really interested in Africanization, if we truly take it seriously that we want to have an African theory of law, then we need to start building it. We need to start developing it. And so this is just the starting point. Um, and yeah, so the African philosophy, you need to look at three different kinds of things. I don't know why my stuff is always three. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just pleasing. OK, so the first question is, is there such a thing as African legal philosophy? The first one says, no, it doesn't exist at all. What you have here is religion and custom and whatever. Guys, you can come sit closer if you want to. Really, I don't mind. Um, then there's the second one that says, yes, there's such a thing, but it's just like any other philosophy. And the fact that you get the natural or positivism debate in African philosophy as well is a proof of that. And the third one is um, the idea that, yes, it's a, it's a real separate thing. And I would add to that my colleague um, Chidi Puku's viewpoint that it's developing. It's still in the development phase. It's still growing. And obviously, as society changes, so will the philosophy. Okay, which is why a lot of stuff that we talk about in African legal philosophy is sort of still happening. It's still growing. Okay, so then as to the nature of African legal philosophy, there are three kinds of African legal philosophies. The first one is what is known as ethno-philosophy. These are not my terms. It's Capoguera. So um, this is the idea very closely tied to natural law that you have in a, in a society, in a community, um, you have certain rules that everyone understands. And this was another colleague of mine's objection to me talking about this at all, because he says, I'm not black and I don't understand how it works. And it's quite possible that he's right. I don't know. But anyway, that's ethno-philosophy for you. Um, the problem, of course, is that if, if you just rely on what everyone knows, then no one outside your community will ever know it. It needs to go beyond that. So then the second one is sage philosophy. Sage philosophy is the idea that there's a person in a community who is wise and who acts in the interest of the community and who settles disputes and disagreements um, with everyone. And um, in a lot of cases, um, we have, in a previous year, we have asked, give us an example of a sage philosopher from the South African context. And um, interestingly enough, a lot of students said to me, uh, to me, Madonsela, Tuli, Tuli. I'm having Tuli and Tuli Murak. <laughs> That's a weird one. OK, so and uh, the question is whether judges, for example, act as sage philosophers in order to reconcile. But remember, it's about reconciliation. It's not about determining who wins and who loses. So if you apply that kind of philosophy to a legal dispute, it becomes difficult. You cannot have a winner or a loser. OK. Uh, you know, uh, Prof, in my limited uh, presenting the knowledge, I was not seeing it as, a, as, a, as an academic or somebody with, with, I was seeing it as somebody who's, who's for instance, a, a chief or an elder in the community. Yeah. I yes. thought that would be a typical such a philosopher. Yeah. Wisdom is sort of uh, central to that person's, you know, disputes come to an elderly person to solve them in a, you know, within a context of a, a bigger yes. community. Yes, I think, I think the question was more towards public figures in South Africa, mm. you know, people that you know of, people who act in that way, um, on on a more like I would say a national level. But okay, um, this the problem remains. Okay. Then um, the last is the nationalist ideological philosophy. And that is tied to um, socialism and black consciousness. And the proponents of this is Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nerere, um, and Senghor, um, the, the guys who developed this kind of what they call African socialism. So that is a very new development in African legal philosophy. 
the idea that you can have a form of socialism that is typically tied to traditional morals, traditional ideas within the community. Okay, then if we move on to the themes in African legal philosophy, and I would suggest this is what you need to concentrate on um, for African legal philosophy, and the first one is then communitarianism. Um, it's a very strong idea in African legal philosophy that the community is more important than the individual. Um, it is something you find in almost every society in the world, and I'm including the West in this. Even though we say the West is very individual, you will get that thing about what you're doing is damaging the country. Although you might have the right, you are damaging your community. So it's, it's something that is very specific and explicit in African legal philosophy, but it's something you find in all communities. And interestingly enough, the smaller the community, the stronger this is. It's about survival. You cannot have people going in different directions when you need to protect the community. Okay. Then the second one is the issue of reconciliation, as I've already talked about. If we truly want to change our courts to embrace reconciliation, we need to change the whole system. And then I'm not sure any of us will have a job. Because our jobs as lawyers is to fight for our clients. Not for reconciliation, but to win. Oops. Which is why we need to start thinking about what we truly want in terms of this. And then the last one is Ubuntu. And this is the one where, I, I'm sorry, but people seem to lose the plot. And very specifically, the article by Puku and Chusey that I have in the, in the study guide tries to list very practical aspects of Ubuntu. Um, having to deal with not making a lot of noise when you have a burial and, and things like that. He's very specific about it. Um, and I would suggest that that's one of the ways in which we need to move forward. And that is to take those very vague ideas that you have in State versus Makwanyane and put it into practice, put it into practical legal rules. Now, the difficulty is that a lot of these rules are already part of South African law. I mean, the whole thing about not making a lot of noise is also in neighbor neighborhood law. Neighbor law? Law of neighbor, whatever. Um, a lot of the rules about the importance of children is already in our law as the best interest of the child. So the interesting thing, and I wish someone would work on this, I don't have the time, but to work out which of these aspects of Ubuntu are already in our law and which are lacking, so that we need to develop that within our law. But Ubuntu seems to be the one thing where people tend to go off the rails, and I don't know, it becomes so vague that I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, let's leave African legal philosophy behind and move on to the third one. And this is the critical theories, which is central to your third assignment. Okay, first of all, I urge you to read the section that tells you where critical theory comes from. It's a new Marxist idea. Yes, it comes from Marxism and then from the work of the Frankfurt Schule, Frankfurter Schule, the school of Frankfurt. And they develop these ideas of Marx, which are very simplistic, um, into more sensible stuff. And the interesting, stuff, interesting thing is that from um, critical theory, we get these four themes that they identify as issues to be addressed within a critical theory. The first is the idea of a skeptical approach. They are skeptical towards society as it is at the moment. They are skeptical that this is the best way the society can be. Okay. The second one is they focus very strongly on the role of power. They, on the idea that some people in society has more power than other people and therefore able to enforce their will on the people in society. The third one is a 
thing that I find students struggle with, and that is it, they always argue for interdisciplinarity. What does that mean? If you take a discipline like law, right? Law is a scientific discipline. But if you start talking about films as a way of explaining what's going on in the law, you're moving between two disciplines. That's interdisciplinarity. People who are taking medical law will know it's interdisciplinary between medicine and law. The same with IT law. It's IT and law. That's interdisciplinarity, and they are proponents of that. Okay. And then the last one is what we call the interpretive turn. And that is the basic idea that everything is interpretation. There are no, one of the philosophers said, there is no there there until we put there there. Okay, so everything that we do is interpreting what's happening around us. What we read is interpretation. What um, uh, people who give evidence say in court, witnesses, thank you. <laughs> what witnesses say in court, we interpret that. It's not as if someone says something and everyone understands the same thing. Everything is interpretation. And if you've ever had that feeling where you see a movie and you think, this is such crap. I shouldn't say that. And then you talk to your friends and they say, it's the best movie ever. That's interpretation. It means different things to different people. OK. So if we then start with critical legal studies and how they Please just use this idea when you are trying to make sense of all the information in the study guide. Um, because I'm now going to look at how they understand each of these broad themes. OK? So you have in the first place, critical legal studies talk about false consciousness. And false consciousness is the idea that things are the way they are because they have to be that way. It's natural. Um, and I, my best example of that is apartheid. I grew up in apartheid. I'm white. I thought that was why, what it's supposed to be like. It didn't help that the churches reinforced that, but that's a different story. OK, so the first one is false consciousness. The second one is law is politics. Politics here meaning the debate about how resources are allocated in society. Law is part of that. And that is why law has a powerful influence. Then they talk about the interdisciplinarity. Um, there are examples in the book, but increasingly you have this thing about where instead of talking about the legal rules, you talk about films. You talk about baseball. You talk about cricket. You talk about a lot of other things. <laughs> many, many examples of that. Um, and then finally, the interpretive turn, and that is their idea of indeterminacy. That a rule in law never has only one meaning. A rule in law can always be interpreted in two or more ways. OK. We will come to your questions. I'm sure you have questions. We'll come to that in a minute. Then critical race theory. Critical race theory is a development that started in America and is now very strong in South Africa. Um, there's a lecturer at University of Pretoria, Joel Mudiri, who is the proponent of this. And you can read his stuff. It's very interesting. And the skeptical approach is the idea of white privilege. The idea that even though the political power is in the hands of the black government, whites still have too much privilege within society. Um, they have more power than they should have. That's what's typical of that. Then um, the role of power, and that is they consciously emphasize color. They say the law cannot be colorblind. You have to see this through the eyes of a black person. The role of color is, in, is emphasized. Then in the interdisciplinarity, a very strong emphasis on storytelling, on saying it's not, you, don't, you can't just read the court case. You have to listen to the stories that the people told that led to this decision. And this was very much the approach of the um, Truth and Reconciliation Committee. The process of telling your story is freeing. 
that's the idea behind this. And then the last one is the, is the one that is weird. And that is the idea of identity politics. The idea that race is not biological. It's a construct. So you have the case of Rachel Dolezal in America, white woman who teaches critical race theory and who says she identifies as a black person. She regards herself as a black person. And of course, that means very interesting things. <laughs> For example, if you next time you're asked what is your race on a government form, and you say, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I have my opinion about this. I'm not going to go into that. But yeah, um, I see even, what's that girl's, that woman's name was just sentenced? She pitched up in court in cornrows. I don't know what that means. OK, then critical gender theory. Critical gender theory you must separate from feminism. Feminism is, in my opinion, simply the idea that women must have the same rights as men. It's simply equality. Critical gender theory goes further in that they say, even if women think they are free, they are not. So that's a form of false consciousness. Um, you can think you're free, you can think you can dress like you want, do the job you want, get the money you want, you're not free. Why? Because the patriarchy. Patriarchy, we're all so oppressed. I, I have my opinion about that as well. Then in the interdisciplinary thing, Patriarchy means men rule everything. Men are actually in control of the whole society. And they have created this illusion that women are free in order to suit themselves. I don't know. But women are not free. OK, whatever. Then um, in terms of the interdisciplinarity, it's, there's an idea in critical gender theory that um, there are masculine ways of knowing, which is different from feminine ways of knowing. So that you can then, if, one conversation please. <laughs> if you have, um, if for example, physics, you can criticize physics because it's masculine. And it should be changed so that it's not so masculine, it becomes more, it's bollocks. And then also, of course, the last one, and this is the one that's very strong on American campuses at the moment, is the, once again, identity politics, the idea that your gender is not biological. And that any man can say, I, from now on, I identify as a woman. I will wear female clothes, and I will go to the female bathroom. <coughs> and you know what? That's the, that's, the, that's the breaking point. You know, you can do in your own what you want, but public toilets? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> anyway. So um, that's a strong thing at the moment in American, on American campuses, the idea that you can choose your gender. And also, there's not just two genders. There's like five, LGBTQ and all the rest of the alphabet letters. OK, so that is the way in which they understand gender as something that is constructed and not something that is given as biological fact, to which um, there's only one response, in my humble opinion. It's not, the enemy isn't men or women, it's bloody stupid people. And no one has the right to be stupid. <laughs> OK. OK, I'm going to close this part of it. Um, just two last comments. Um, also, there are two types of people who laugh at the law, those who break it and those who make it. Now, a last comment on this. I said to you, please don't venture into religion, don't venture into constitutional law, don't venture into human rights law. And I was telling one student on the phone that I feel like that meme of this is Sparta, stick to the legal philosophy. That's what we do here. He said I gave him an uncomfortable image in his head, so <laughs> I won't do it again. <laughs> That's it for the
this section of the work, with this section of the conversation. And you know what? I think we're done. <laughs>